two or three public figures, writers, politicians, musicians, actors, and so on, to explore their family histories. The guests don't usually know much about their ancestors further back than their great-grandparents or so. And Finding Your Roots has a team of genealogists who comb through records to learn as much as they can about each guest's family tree. Not just the names, but the stories of these people's lives. So Mary Steenburgen learned about her ancestor who served in the Revolutionary War. A soldier so hopelessly undisciplined, he made George Washington want to quit his command. And Leslie Odom Jr., who assumed that all his ancestors were American going back hundreds of years, found out that his great-grandfather immigrated from South Africa in the 1920s. At the end of the show, Dr. Gates asks each guest what it's like to have learned about their family histories. Nearly all of them say something like, I know better who I am now because I know where I've come from the hardship and sometimes shame, along with heroism and sacrifice. Most Americans define our identity through our work, and all these guests are successful people at the top of their fields. But they learn they aren't only musicians, actors, politicians, and so on. Their identity comes from claiming their place in a larger story. Jesus is coming off a spiritual high at this point in Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel. He's just been baptized in the River Jordan. After he emerged from the muddy water and was praying, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and he heard a voice saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit continues to fill Jesus, and the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. The wilderness in the Bible is a place of danger. There's wild animals, hot days and cold nights, rocky ravines where you might fall, not much food or water. The wilderness is also where you go to meet God. It's where Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist and the Jewish exiles have profound encounters with God that shape their entire lives. For Jesus, the wilderness is a place of danger, and it's a place of spiritual transformation. It's where he has his first encounter with the devil. You might have heard me say before that Jesus and all his first followers were Jewish. And in Judaism, the devil is a member of God's heavenly court who tests the righteous. He tests Jesus with temptations that might be appealing to us. The devil asks Jesus to turn a stone into bread. Jesus has not eaten anything for 40 days. He's ravenously hungry. He could satisfy his own hunger and also create enough bread to feed the entire world. Then the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and offers Jesus glory and authority. Jesus could sweep away every ruler on the planet and have unlimited power for himself. And then the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point in the highest city in the country, and says, throw yourself down and let God's angels catch you. Half a million people in Jerusalem would see it. Jesus would be instantly famous. We might notice the language the devil uses for these temptations. The devil's tests are about Jesus' identity. If you are the Son of God, command this stone to turn into bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. The devil is asking, who are you, really? Jesus doesn't answer the devil directly. He gives these sideways responses. Each time, Jesus quotes the Jewish Bible, three different verses that all put God at the center of human life. Jesus will not turn a stone into bread because one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Jesus will not worship the devil because God's people are commanded to worship the Lord our God and serve only God. Jesus will not hurl himself off the temple because humanity is warned not to put God to the test. Jesus doesn't ever say whether he is the son of God or not. He points to God as the center of his life, where God has been for generations of Jews before Jesus. Jesus claims his place in a larger story, the story of the people of God. Jesus is one of them, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Tamar, Miriam, Deborah, millions of others whose names have been lost. Jesus is who he is because of the faithful people who have come before him. That identity, that place in the story of God's people, enables him to say no to the devil's temptations. We might wish we had faith like that, the kind of confidence in our identity that allows us to resist even the devil. But Jesus' faith isn't the only kind of faith. There's a quieter confidence in who you are that comes from the faith we see in the book of Deuteronomy. At the very end of Moses' life, he has led the Israelite people within sight of the promised land. Moses knows he won't make it to the promised land himself, but he wants to leave his people with some final instruction when they do get there. So once the Israelites have been in the promised land for a year or two, when they have crops to harvest for the first time, they are to offer the first fruits of their harvest to God at the house of worship. When the priest takes their offering, the people are to recite their history. They are descended from a wandering Aramean, perishing from hunger, who went down to Egypt. In Egypt, their numbers grew and grew. One person became a whole people. But it wasn't easy for them. The Egyptians treated the Israelites harshly and afflicted them with forced labor. The Israelites cried to God, the God of their ancestors. God heard their cries. God acted to free them. God provided for them as God brought them into the promised land. So now the Israelites offer the first fruits of that land to God. And they celebrate God's goodness and abundance. The ones who have their own property and refugees and Levites who don't have an inheritance of their own. That story, the story of the wandering Aramean and the people who became a people and the trip out of Egypt and the celebration in the promised land is how the Israelites know who they are. He became a we, becomes an I. I have a place in this story. And as the Israelites make their place in a new land, as they break ground for farming and build houses and learn the landscape, Moses tells them to remember two things, the collective trauma of slavery in Egypt and God's care and provision for them. Claim your place in this larger story of God's people. The task that faces the Israelites in the promised land is not as dramatic as resisting the temptations of the devil in the wilderness, but they are facing years of hard work. Their faith will guide them through the faith that tells them who they are now because of who their people have been. I find that kind of faith reassuring as we pray for an end to war, cope with an uncertain economy, and enter year three of this pandemic, which is maybe over now, maybe not. Who really knows? I don't know about you, but I don't have the spiritual or emotional energy to resist the devil and his temptations right now. The work that lies ahead of us these days is more like building new lives in the promised land, connecting and reconnecting with each other, binding up wounds of body and heart and spirit, listening for and answering God's call to us in this changed world, taking time for rest and recreation, we have some collective trauma to remember, 
And we'll also want to recall how God has been with us, how God has heard our cries and acted to help us and provided for us through this time. As we do that, we claim our place in the larger story of God's people. We know who we are because of Moses and Jesus and Mary Magdalene and James Kilborn and Mary Chase and the millions of other ancestors who came before us. If finding your roots ever opens up the show to people who are not famous, I would love to be a guest sometime. There's lots about my family history I would like to learn. Maybe you would like to know more about your ancestors too. Yet we have found our roots in the story of the people of God, and it tells us who we are. Our identity as Christians, as followers of Jesus, comes from claiming our place in that larger story of faith. We know who we are because we know who we have come from. And knowing who we are, trusting that God will provide for us just as God provided for those who came before, we can do the work God has given us to do.